It was a queer situation that we were in. At night, one was a hunted fugitive, but in the daytime one could live an almost normal life. Every house known to Harbour Poom supporters was, or at any rate was likely to be, under observation, and it was impossible to go to a hotel or boarding house because it had been decreed that on the arrival of a stranger the hotel keeper must inform the police immediately. Practically, this meant spending the night out of doors. In the daytime, on the other hand, in a town the size of Barcelona, you were fairly safe. The streets were thronged by civil guards, assault guards, carabineros, and ordinary police. Besides, God knows how many spies in plain clothes. Still, they could not stop everyone who passed, and if you looked normal you might escape notice. The thing to do was to avoid hanging round poom buildings and going to cafes and restaurants where the waiters knew you by sight. I spent a long time that day and the next in having a bath at one of the public baths. This struck me as a good way of putting in the time and keeping out of sight. Unfortunately, the same idea occurred to a lot of people, and a few days later, after I left Barcelona, the police raided one of the public baths and arrested a number of Trotskyists in a state of nature. Halfway up the Ramblas, I ran into one of the wounded men from the sanatorium Morin. We exchanged the sort of invisible wink that people were exchanging at that time, and managed in an unobtrusive way to meet in a cafe further up the street. He had escaped arrest when the Morin was raided, but, like the others, had been driven into the street. He was in shirt sleeves, had had to flee without his jacket, and had no money. He described to me how one of the civil guards had torn the large coloured portrait of Maureen from the wall and kicked it to pieces. Maureen, one of the founders of the Poom, was a prisoner in the hands of the fascists, and at that time was believed to have been shot by them. I met my wife at the British consulate at ten o'clock. McNair and Cotman turned up shortly afterwards. The first thing they told me was that Bob Smilly was dead. He died in prison at Valencia. Of what, nobody knew for certain. He had been buried immediately, and the ILP representative on the spot, David Murray, had been refused permission to see his body. Of course, I assumed at once that Smilly had been shot. That was what everyone believed at the time. But I've since thought that I may have been wrong. Later, the cause of his death was given out as appendicitis, and we heard afterwards from another prisoner who had been released that Smilly had certainly been ill in prison, so perhaps the appendicitis story was true. The refusal to let Murray see his body may have been due to pure spite. I must say this, however. Bob Smilly was only twenty-two years old, and physically he was one of the toughest people I've met. He was, I think, the only person I knew, English or Spanish, who went three months in the trenches without a day's illness. People so tough as that do not usually die of appendicitis if they're properly looked after. But when you saw what the Spanish jails were like, the makeshift jails used for political prisoners, you realised how much chance there was of a sick man getting proper attention. The jails were places that could only be described as dungeons. In England, you'd have to go back to the 18th century to find anything comparable. People were penned together in small rooms where there was barely space for them to lie down, and often they were kept in cellars and other dark places. This was not as a temporary measure. There were cases of people being kept four and five months almost without sight of daylight, and they were fed on a filthy and insufficient diet of two plates of soup and two pieces of bread a day. Some months later, however, the food seems to have improved a little. I am not exaggerating. Ask any political prisoner who was imprisoned in Spain. I have had accounts of the Spanish jails from a number of separate sources, and they agree with one another too well to be disbelieved. Besides, I had a few glimpses into one Spanish jail myself. Another English friend who was imprisoned later writes that his experiences in jail makes Smilly's case easier to understand. Smilly's death is not a thing I can easily forgive. Here was this brave and gifted boy who had thrown up his career at Glasgow University in order to come and fight against fascism, and who, as I saw for myself, had done his job at the front with faultless courage and willingness. 
and all they could find to do with him was to fling him into jail and let him die like a neglected animal. I know that in the middle of a huge and bloody war it's no use making too much fuss over an individual death. One aeroplane bomb in a crowded street causes more suffering than quite a lot of political persecution. But what angers one about a death like this is its utter pointlessness. To be killed in battle, yes, that is what one expects. But to be flung into jail, not even for any imaginary offence, but simply owing to dull, blind spite, and then left to die in solitude, that's a different matter. I fail to see how this kind of thing, and it is not as though Smilly's case were exceptional, brought victory any nearer. My wife and I visited Cop that afternoon. You were allowed to visit prisoners who were not incommunicado, though it was not safe to do so more than once or twice. The police watched the people who came and went, and if you visited the jails too often, you stamped yourself as a friend of Trotskyists, and probably ended in jail yourself. This had already happened to a number of people. Cop was not incommunicado, and we got a permit to see him without difficulty. As they led us through the steel doors into the jail, a Spanish militiaman, whom I had known at the front, was being led out between two civil guards. His eye met mine. Again, the ghostly wink. And the first person we saw inside was an American militiaman, who had left for home a few days earlier. His papers were in good order, but they had arrested him at the frontier all the same, probably because he was still wearing corduroy breeches, and was therefore identifiable as a militiaman. We walked past one another, as though we had been total strangers. That was dreadful. I'd known him for months, had shared a dugout with him. He had helped to carry me down the line when I was wounded. But it was the only thing one could do. The blue-clad guards were snooping everywhere. It would be fatal to recognize too many people. The so-called jail was really the ground floor of a shop, into two rooms, each measuring about twenty feet square, close on a hundred people were penned. The place had the real eighteenth-century Newgate calendar appearance, with its frowsy dirt, its huddle of human bodies, its lack of furniture, just the bare stone floor, one bench and a few ragged blankets, and its murky light, for the corrugated steel shutters had been drawn over the windows. On the grimy walls, revolutionary slogans, Visca Pum, Viva la Revolución, and so forth, had been scrawled. The place had been used as a dump for political prisoners for months past. There was a deafening racket of voices. This was the visiting hour, and the place was so packed with people that it was difficult to move. Nearly all of them were of the poorest of the working-class population. You saw women undoing pitiful packets of food which they had brought for their imprisoned menfolk. There were several of the wounded men from the sanatorium Morin among the prisoners. Two of them had amputated legs. One of them had been brought to prison without his crutch and was hopping about on one foot. There was also a boy of not more than twelve. They were even arresting children, apparently. The place had the beastly stench that you always get when crowds of people are penned together without proper sanitary arrangements. Cop elbowed his way through the crowd to meet us. His plump, fresh-coloured face looked much as usual, and in that filthy place he kept his uniform neat, and had even contrived to shave. There was another officer in the uniform of the popular army among the prisoners. He and Cop saluted as they struggled past one another. The gesture was pathetic, somehow. Cop seemed in excellent spirits. Well, I suppose we shall all be shot, he said cheerfully. The word shot gave me a sort of inward shudder. A bullet had entered my own body recently, and the feeling of it was fresh in my memory. It is not nice to think of that happening to anyone you know well. At that time I took it for granted that all the principal people in the Poom and Cop among them would be shot. The first rumour of Nin's death had just filtered through, and we knew that the Poom were being accused of treachery and espionage. Everything pointed to a huge frame-up trial, followed by a massacre of leading Trotskyists. It's a terrible thing to see your friend in jail and to know yourself impotent to help him, for there was nothing that one could do. 
useless even to appeal to the Belgian authorities, for Cop had broken the law of his own country by coming here. I had to leave most of the talking to my wife. With my squeaking voice, I couldn't make myself heard in the din. Cop was telling us about the friends he'd made among the other prisoners, about the guards, some of whom were good fellows, but some of whom abused and beat the more timid prisoners, and about the food, which was pig wash. Fortunately, we had thought to bring a packet of food, also cigarettes. Then Cop began telling us about the papers that had been taken from him when he was arrested. Among them was his letter from the Ministry of War, addressed to the Colonel commanding engineering operations in the Army of the East. The police had seized it and refused to give it back. It was said to be lying in the chief of police's office. It might make a very great difference if it were recovered. I saw instantly how important this might be, an official letter of that kind, bearing the recommendation of the Ministry of War and of General Posas, would establish Cop's bona fides. But the trouble was to prove that the letter existed. If it were opened in the chief of police's office, one could be sure that some narc or other would destroy it. There was only one person who might possibly be able to get it back, and that was the officer to whom it was addressed. Cop had already thought of this, and he had written a letter which he wanted me to smuggle out of the jail and post, but it was obviously quicker and surer to go in person. I left my wife with Cop, rushed out, and after a long search found a taxi. I knew that time was everything. It was now about half past five. The colonel would probably leave his office at six, and by tomorrow the letter might be God knew where, destroyed perhaps or lost somewhere in the chaos of documents that was presumably piling up as suspect after suspect was arrested. The colonel's office was at the war department, down by the quay. As I hurried up the steps, the assault guard on duty at the door barred the way with his long bayonet and demanded papers. I waved my discharge ticket at him. Evidently he couldn't read, and he let me pass, impressed by the vague mystery of papers. Inside, the place was a huge, complicated warren, running round a central courtyard with hundreds of offices on each floor. And, as this was Spain, nobody had the vaguest idea where the office I was looking for was. I kept repeating El Coronel, Jefe de Ingenieros, People smiled and shrugged their shoulders gracefully. Everyone who had an opinion sent me in a different direction, up these stairs, down those along interminable passages, which turned out to be blind alleys, and time was slipping away. I had the strangest sensation of being in a nightmare, the rushing up and down flights of stairs, the mysterious people coming and going, the glimpses through open doors of chaotic offices, with papers strewn everywhere and typewriters clicking, and time slipping away, and a life perhaps in the balance. However, I got there in time, and slightly to my surprise, I was granted a hearing. I did not see the colonel, but his aide-de-camp or secretary, a little slip of an officer in smart uniform, with large and squinting eyes, came out to interview me in the ante-room. I began to pour forth my story. I had come on behalf of my superior officer, Major Jorge Kopp, who was on an urgent mission to the front and had been arrested by mistake. The letter to the colonel was of a confidential nature and should be recovered without delay. I had served with Cop for months. He was an officer of the highest character. Obviously his arrest was a mistake. The police had confused him with someone else, etc., etc., etc. I kept piling it on about the urgency of Cop's mission to the front, knowing that this was the strongest point. But it must have sounded a strange tale in my villainous Spanish, which elapsed into French at every crisis. The worst was that my voice gave out almost at once, and it was only by violent straining that I could produce a sort of croak. I was in dread that it would disappear altogether, and the little officer would grow tired of trying to listen to me. I've often wondered what he thought was wrong with my voice, whether he thought I was drunk or merely suffering from a guilty conscience. However, he heard me patiently, nodded his head a great number of times, and gave a guarded assent to what I said. Yes, it sounded as though there might have been a mistake. Clearly the matter should be looked into. Manana, I protested, not manana. The matter was urgent. Cop was due at the front already. Again, the officer seemed to agree. Then came the question I was dreading. This 
Major Cop, what force was he serving in? The terrible word had to come out. In the Poom Militia. Poom! I wish I could convey to you the shocked alarm in his voice. You have got to remember how the Poom was regarded at that moment. The spy scare was at its height. Probably all good Republicans did believe for a day or two that the Poom was a huge spying organization in German pay. To have to say such a thing to an officer of the popular army was like going into the cavalry club immediately after the Red Letter Scare and announcing yourself a communist. His dark eyes moved obliquely across my face. Another long pause. Then he said slowly, And you say you were with him at the front? Then you were serving in the Poom militia yourself? Yes. He turned and dived into the colonel's room. I could hear an agitated conversation. It's all up, I thought. We should never get cop's letter back. Moreover, I had had to confess that I was in the Poom myself. And no doubt they would ring up the police and get me arrested, just to add another Trotskyist to the bag. Presently, however, the officer reappeared, fitting on his cap, and sternly signed to me to follow. We were going to the chief of police's office. It was a long way, twenty minutes' walk. The little officer marched stiffly in front with a military step. We did not exchange a single word the whole way. When we got to the chief of police's office, a crowd of the most dreadful-looking scoundrels, obviously police narcs, informers, and spies of every kind, were hanging about outside the door. The little officer went in. There was a long, heated conversation. You could hear voices furiously raised. You pictured violent gestures, shruggings of the shoulders, bangings on the table. Evidently, the police were refusing to give the letter up. At last, however, the officer emerged, flushed, but carrying a large official envelope. It was Cop's letter. We had won a tiny victory, which, as it turned out, made not the slightest difference. The letter was duly delivered, but Cop's military superiors were quite unable to get him out of jail. The officer promised me that the letter should be delivered. But what about Cop? I said. Could we not get him released? He shrugged his shoulders. That was another matter. They didn't know what Cop had been arrested for. He would only tell me that the proper inquiries would be made. There was no more to be said. It was time to part. Both of us bowed slightly. And then there happened a strange and moving thing. The little officer hesitated a moment, then stepped across and shook hands with me. I don't know if I can bring home to you how deeply that action touched me. It sounds a small thing, but it was not. You've got to realise what was the feeling of the time, the horrible atmosphere of suspicion and hatred the lies and rumours circulating everywhere, the posters screaming from the hoardings that I and everyone like me was a fascist spy. And you've got to remember that we were standing outside the chief of police's office, in front of that filthy gang of tale-bearers and agent provocateur, any one of whom might know that I was wanted by the police. It was like publicly shaking hands with a German during the Great War. I suppose he'd decided in some way that I was not really a fascist spy. Still, it was good of him to shake hands. I record this, trivial though it may sound, because it is somehow typical of Spain, of the flashes of magnanimity that you get from Spaniards in the worst of circumstances. I have the most evil memories of Spain, but I have very few bad memories of Spaniards. I only twice remember even being seriously angry with a Spaniard, and on each occasion when I look back I believe I was in the wrong myself. They have, there is no doubt, a generosity, a species of nobility that do not really belong to the twentieth century. It is this that makes one hope that in Spain even fascism may take a comparatively loose and bearable form. Few Spaniards possess the damnable efficiency and consistency that a modern totalitarian state needs. There had been a queer little illustration of this fact a few nights earlier, when the police had searched my wife's room. 
As a matter of fact, that search was a very interesting business, and I wish I'd seen it, though perhaps it was well that I did not, for I might not have kept my temper. The police conducted the search in the recognised Ogpu or Gestapo style. In the small hours of the morning there was a pounding on the door, and six men marched in, switched on the light, and immediately took up various positions about the room, obviously agreed upon beforehand. They then searched both rooms. There was a bathroom attached, with inconceivable thoroughness. They sounded the walls, took up the mats, examined the floor, felt the curtains, probed under the bath and the radiator, emptied every drawer and suitcase, and felt every garment and held it up to the light. They impounded all papers, including the contents of the waste paper basket, and all our books into the bargain. They were thrown into ecstasies of suspicion by finding that we possessed a French translation of Hitler's Mein Kampf. If that had been the only book they found, our doom would have been sealed. It's obvious that a person who reads Mein Kampf must be a fascist. The next moment, however, they came upon a copy of Stalin's pamphlet, Ways of Liquidating Trotskyists and Other Double Dealers, which reassured them somewhat. In one drawer... There was a number of packets of cigarette papers. They picked each packet to pieces and examined each paper separately in case there should be messages written on them. Altogether, they were on the job for nearly two hours. Yet all this time, they never searched the bed. My wife was lying in bed all the while. Obviously, there might have been half a dozen submachine guns under the mattress, not to mention a library of Trotsky's documents under the pillow. Yet the detectives made no move to touch the bed, never even looked underneath it. I cannot believe that this is a regular feature of the Ogpu routine. One must remember that the police were almost entirely under communist control, and these men were probably communist party members themselves, but they were also Spaniards, and to turn a woman out of bed was a little too much for them. This part of the job was silently dropped, making the whole search meaningless. That night... McNair, Cotman, and I slept in some long grass at the edge of a derelict building lot. It was a cold night for the time of year, and no one slept much. I remember the long, dismal hours of loitering about before one could get a cup of coffee. For the first time since I'd been in Barcelona, I went to have a look at the cathedral. A modern cathedral, and one of the most hideous buildings in the world. It has four crenellated spires exactly the shape of hock bottles. Unlike most of the churches in Barcelona, it was not damaged during the revolution. It was spared because of its artistic value, people said. I think the anarchists showed bad taste in not blowing it up when they had the chance, though they did hang a red and black banner between its spires. That afternoon, my wife and I went to see Cop for the last time. There was nothing that we could do for him, absolutely nothing except to say goodbye and leave money with Spanish friends who would take him food and cigarettes. A little while later, however, after we had left Barcelona, he was placed in Comunicado, and not even food could be sent to him. That night, walking down the Ramblas, we passed the Café Mocha, which the civil guards were still holding in force. On an impulse, I went in and spoke to two of them, who were leaning against the counter, with their rifles slung over their shoulders. I asked them if they knew which of their comrades had been on duty here at the time of the May fighting. They did not know, and, with the usual Spanish vagueness, didn't know how one could find out. I said that my friend Jorge Kopp was in prison and would perhaps be put on trial for something in connection with the May fighting, that the men who were on duty here would know that he had stopped the fighting and saved some of their lives, they ought to come forward and give evidence to that effect. One of the men I was talking to was a dull, heavy-looking man who kept shaking his head because he couldn't hear my voice in the din of the traffic. But the other was different. He said he had heard of Kopf's action from some of his comrades. Kopf was buen chico, a good fellow. But even at the time I knew that it was all useless. If Kopf were ever tried, it would be, as in all such trials, with faked evidence. If he has been shot, and I'm afraid it's quite likely, that will be his epitaph. 
one Chico of the poor civil guard who was part of a dirty system but had remained enough of a human being to know a decent action when he saw one. It was an extraordinary, insane existence that we were leading. By night we were criminals, but by day we were prosperous English visitors. That was our pose, anyway. Even after a night in the open, a shave, a bath, and a shoe shine do wonders with your appearance. The safest thing at present was to look as bourgeois as possible. We frequented the fashionable residential quarter of the town, where our faces were not known, went to expensive restaurants, and were very English with the waiters. For the first time in my life I took to writing things on walls. The passageways of several smart restaurants had visca pum scrawled on them as large as I could write it. All the while, though I was technically in hiding, I could not feel myself in danger. The whole thing seemed too absurd. I had the ineradicable English belief that they cannot arrest you unless you've broken the law. It is the most dangerous belief to have during a political pogrom. There was a warrant out for McNair's arrest, and the chances were that the rest of us were on the list as well. The arrests, raids, searchings were continuing without pause. Practically everyone we knew, except those who were still at the front, was in jail by this time. The police were even boarding the French ships that periodically took off refugees and seizing suspected Trotskyists. Thanks to the kindness of the British consul, who must have had a very trying time during that week, we had managed to get our passports in order. The sooner we left, the better. There was a train that was due to leave the Pobu at half past seven in the evening, and might normally be expected to leave at about half past eight. We arranged that my wife should order a taxi beforehand and then pack her bags, pay her bill, and leave the hotel at the last possible moment. If she gave the hotel people too much notice, they would be sure to send for the police. I got down to the station at about seven to find that the train had already gone. It had left at ten to seven. The engine driver had changed his mind, as usual. Fortunately, we managed to warn my wife in time. There was another train early the following morning. McNair, Cotman, and I had dinner at a little restaurant near the station, and by cautious questioning discovered that the restaurant keeper was a CNT member and friendly. He let us a three-bedded room and forgot to warn the police. It was the first time in five nights that I had been able to sleep with my clothes off. Next morning, my wife slipped out of the hotel successfully. The train was about an hour late in starting. I filled in the time by writing a long letter to the Ministry of War telling them about Cop's case, that without a doubt he had been arrested by mistake, that he was urgently needed at the front, that countless people would testify that he was innocent of any offence, etc., etc., etc. I wonder if anyone read that letter. Written on pages torn out of a notebook in wobbly handwriting, my fingers were still partly paralysed, and still more wobbly Spanish. At any rate, neither this letter nor anything else took effect. As I write, six months after the event, Cop, if he has not been shot, is still in jail, untried and uncharged. At the beginning we had two or three letters from him, smuggled out by released prisoners and posted in France. They all told the same story. Imprisonment in filthy dark dens, bad and insufficient food, serious illness due to the conditions of imprisonment, and refusal of medical attention. I have had all this confirmed from several other sources, English and French. More recently, he disappeared into one of the secret prisons, with which it seems impossible to make any kind of communication. His case is the case of scores or hundreds of foreigners, and no one knows how many thousands of Spaniards. In the end, we crossed the frontier without incident. The train had a first class and a dining car, the first I'd seen in Spain. Until recently, there had been only one class on the trains in Catalonia. Two detectives came round the train, taking the names of foreigners, but when they saw us in the dining car, they seemed satisfied that we were respectable. It was queer how everything had changed. Only six months ago, when the anarchists still reigned, it was looking like a proletarian that made you respectable. On the way down from Perpignan to Sabère, a French commercial traveller in my carriage had said to me in all solemnity, 
You mustn't go into Spain looking like that. Take off that collar and tie. They'll tear them off you in Barcelona. He was exaggerating, but it showed how Catalonia was regarded. And at the frontier, the anarchist guards had turned back a smartly dressed Frenchman and his wife solely, I think, because they looked too bourgeois. Now it was the other way about. To look bourgeois was the one salvation. At the passport office, they looked us up in the card index of suspects, but thanks to the inefficiency of the police, our names were not listed, not even McNair's. We were searched from head to foot, but we possessed nothing incriminating except my discharge papers, and the carabineros who searched me did not know that the 29th Division was the poom. So we slipped through the barrier, and after just six months, I was on French soil again. My only souvenirs of Spain were a goatskin water bottle and one of those tiny iron lamps in which the Aragon peasants burn olive oil. Lamps almost exactly the shape of the terracotta lamps that the Romans used two thousand years ago, which I had picked up in some ruined hut and which had somehow got stuck in my luggage. After all, it turned out that we had come away none too soon. The very first newspaper we saw announced McNair's arrest for espionage. The Spanish authorities had been a little premature in announcing this. Fortunately, Trotskyism is not extraditable. I wonder what is the appropriate first action when you come from a country at war and set foot on peaceful soil. Mine was to rush to the tobacco kiosk and buy as many cigars and cigarettes as I could stuff into my pockets. Then we all went to the buffet and had a cup of tea. The first tea with fresh milk in it that we had had for many months. It was several days before I could get used to the idea that you could buy cigarettes whenever you wanted them. I always half expected to see the tobacconist store barred and the forbidding notice, No hay tobacco in the window. McNair and Cotman were going on to Paris. My wife and I got off the train at Bagnols, the first station up the line, feeling that we would like a rest. We were not too well received in Bagnols when they discovered that we had come from Barcelona. Quite a number of times I was involved in the same conversation. You come from Spain. Which side were you fighting on? The government? Ah. And then the marked coolness. The little town seemed solidly pro-Franco, no doubt because of the various Spanish fascist refugees who had arrived there from time to time. The waiter at the cafe I frequented was a pro-Franco Spaniard and used to give me lowering glances as he served me with an aperitif. It was otherwise in Pelpignan, which was stiff with government partisans and where all the different factions were caballing against one another almost as in Barcelona. There was one café where the word poom immediately procured you French friends and smiles from the waiter. I think we stayed three days in Barnul. It was a strangely restless time. In this quiet fishing town, remote from bombs, machine guns, food queues, propaganda and intrigue, we ought to have felt profoundly relieved and thankful. We felt nothing of the kind. The things we had seen in Spain did not recede and fall into proportion now that we were away from them. Instead, they rushed back upon us and were far more vivid than before. We thought, talked, dreamed incessantly of Spain. For months past, we had been telling ourselves that when we get out of Spain, we would go somewhere beside the Mediterranean and be quiet for a little while and perhaps do a little fishing. But now that we were here, it was merely a bore and a disappointment. It was chilly weather, a persistent wind blew off the sea, the water was dull and choppy. Round the harbour's edge, a scum of ashes, corks and fish guts bobbed against the stones. It sounds like lunacy, but the thing that both of us wanted was to be back in Spain. Though it could have done no good to anybody, might indeed have done serious harm, both of us wished that we had stayed to be imprisoned along with the others. I suppose I failed to convey more than a little of what those months in Spain mean to me. I've recorded some of the outward events, but I cannot record the feeling they've left me with. It's all mixed up with sights, smells and sounds that cannot be conveyed in writing. The smell of the trenches, the mountain dawns stretching away into inconceivable distances, the frosty crackle of bullets, the roar and glare of bombs, 
the clear, cold light of the Barcelona mornings, and the stamp of boots in the barrack yard back in December when people still believed in the revolution, and the food queues and the red and black flags and the faces of Spanish militiamen, above all, the faces of militiamen, men whom I knew in the line, and have now scattered Lord knows where, some killed in battle, some maimed, some in prison, most of them, I hope, still safe and sound. Good luck to them all. I hope they win their war and drive all the foreigners out of Spain, Germans, Russians, and Italians alike. This war, in which I played so ineffectual a part, has left me with memories that are mostly evil, and yet I do not wish that I had missed it. When you have had a glimpse of such a disaster as this, and however it ends, the Spanish War will turn out to have been appalling disaster, quite apart from the slaughter and physical suffering, the result is not necessarily disillusionment and cynicism. Curiously enough, the whole experience has left me with not less but more belief in the decency of human beings, and I hope the account I've given is not too misleading. I believe that on such an issue as this, no one is or can be completely truthful. It's difficult to be certain about anything except what you've seen with your own eyes, and consciously or unconsciously everyone writes as a partisan. In case I've not said this somewhere earlier in the book, I'll say it now. Beware of my partisanship, my mistakes of fact, and the distortion inevitably caused by my having seen only one corner of events. And beware of exactly the same things when you read any other book on this period of the Spanish War. Because of the feeling that we ought to be doing something, though actually there was nothing we could do, we left Barnules earlier than we'd intended. With every mile that she went northward, France grew greener and softer, away from the mountain and the vine, back to the meadow and the elm. When I passed through Paris on my way to Spain, it had seemed to me decayed and gloomy, very different from the Paris I'd known eight years earlier, when living was cheap and Hitler was not heard of. Half the cafes I used to know were shut for lack of custom, and everyone was obsessed with the high cost of living and the fear of war. Now, after poor Spain, even Paris seemed gay and prosperous, and the exhibition was in full swing, though we managed to avoid visiting it. And then England. Southern England, probably the sleekest landscape in the world. It's difficult when you pass that way, especially when you're peacefully recovering from seasickness, with the plush cushions of a boat train carriage under your bum to believe that anything is really happening anywhere. Earthquakes in Japan, famines in China, revolutions in Mexico. Don't worry, the milk will be on the doorstep tomorrow morning. The new statesman will come out on Friday. The industrial towns were far away, a smudge of smoke and misery hidden by the curve of the earth's surface. Down here... It was still the England I had known in my childhood, the railway cuttings smothered in wildflowers, the deep meadows where the great shining horses browse and meditate, the slow-moving streams bordered by willows, the green bosoms of the elms, the lark spurs in the cottage gardens, and then the huge, peaceful wilderness of outer London the barges on the miry river, the familiar streets, the posters telling of cricket matches and royal weddings, the men in bowler hats, the pigeons in Trafalgar Square, the red buses, the blue policemen, all sleeping the deep, deep sleep of England, from which I sometimes fear that we shall never wake till we are jerked out of it by the roar of bombs.